Lord Russell, what is your definition of fanaticism? I should say that uh, fanaticism consists in thinking some one matter so overwhelmingly important that it outweighs everything else at all. To take an example, I suppose all decent people dislike cruelty to dogs. But if you thought the cruelty to dogs was so atrocious that no other cruelty should be objected to in comparison, then you would be a fanatic. But do you think this has happened a great deal in human history, that large groups of people have been seized with fanaticism? Yes, it's happened at most periods in most parts of the world. It's one of the diseases of the mind to which communities are subject. Which would you say were some of the worst occasions? There have been various occasions one could mention. Take anti-Semitism, that is one of the most dreadful, because that's the worst manifestations of that are recent. And uh, we're so dreadful one can hardly bear to think of them. Well, that, uh, I know it isn't the right thing to say, it isn't considered the right thing to say, but anti-Semitism mainly came in with Christianity. Before that, there was very, very much less. But the moment the Roman government became Christian, it began to be anti-Semitic. Why was that? And because they said that uh, the Jews killed Christ, and so it gave them a justification for hating the Jews. I've no doubt there really were economic motives, but uh, that was the justification. But why do you think people do get seized in large numbers with fanaticism? Well, it's partly that it gives you a cosy feeling of cooperation. A fanatical group altogether have a comfortable feeling that they're all friends of each other. Uh, they're all very much excited about the same thing. Uh, you can see it in any uh, uh, political party. There's always a fringe of fanatics in any political party. And they feel awfully cosy with each other. And when that is spread about, and is combined with a propensity to hate some other group, uh, you get uh, fanaticism well developed. But might not fanaticism at times provide a kind of mainspring for good actions? It provides a mainspring for actions, all right, but I can't think of any instance in history where it's provided a mainspring for good actions, always, I think, for bad ones because it is partial, because it almost inevitably involves some kind of hatred. You hate the people who don't share your fanaticism. It's uh, almost inevitable. But then if it gets taken over by uh, economic considerations, say that like the Crusades, then fanaticism disappears and perhaps does no harm. Well, I don't know. I I can't uh, think of any good that the Crusades did. The Crusades had, of course, two uh, different streams in them, a fanatical stream and an economic stream. The economic thing was very strong indeed, but uh, it wouldn't have worked without the fanaticism. The fanaticism provided the troops and the economic motive of the generals, <laughs> roughly speaking. <laughs> but what part would you say that witchcraft has played in fanaticism? Oh, uh, witchcraft played a terrible, terrible part, uh, especially uh, from uh, oh, from about 1450 to about uh, 1600, a little longer than 1600. Uh, quite terrible part. There was a work called uh, The Hammer of Female Malefactors, which was uh, written by an eminent ecclesiastic and uh, inspired... Uh, the most mad profusion of uh, witch hunts, which uh, the people themselves believed. Uh, I think it's very likely that Joan of Arc believed she was a witch. Certainly a great many people condemned as witches did believe they were witches. And uh, there was an enormous spread of cruelty. Now, uh, Sir Thomas Brown, you would say, when you read his works, he seems like a very humane and cultivated person. But he uh, actually took part in the trials of witches 
on the side of the prosecution, and he said that to deny witchcraft is a form of atheism, because after all the Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, and therefore if you don't think it's right to burn them because you think witches, you must be disbelieving in the Bible and therefore be an atheist. But how is it that quite sane people, on the surface at any rate, can be fanatical? Well, sanity is a relative term. Uh, very, very few people are sane all through. Almost everybody has corners where they're mad. I remember once I was motoring in California on a very, very wet day, and we picked up a pedestrian who was getting wet through, and he inveighed against uh, all kinds of race prejudice. He said it was the most dreadful thing, and I entirely agreed with him. And then somebody mentioned the Philippines, and he said, all Filipinos are vile. <laughs> well, you see, he had that little corner of insanity. But why do you attach so much importance to the subject of fanaticism? Because a very great part of the evils that the world is suffering are due to fanaticism. A very, very great part. Uh, always has been so, and it's worse in the present day than it's ever been before. I don't think fanaticism is more prevalent, but it is doing more harm than it has ever done before in human history. Well, can you elaborate that a bit? Yes, certainly. It deserves to be elaborated. I think that the East-West tension, which is threatening us all in the most terrible fashion, is mainly due to fanatical belief in communism or anti-communism, as the case may be. Both sides believe their own creed too strongly. They believe it in the way that I defined as fanatical, that they think that is to say that the prevention of what they regard as wicked on the other side is more important even than the continued existence of the human race, and that is fanatical. And it is that fanaticism which is threatening us all, a fanaticism which exists on both sides. What's your definition of toleration? A toleration uh, consists... Uh, well, it varies according to what direction you're thinking. Toleration of opinion, uh, if it's really full-blown, consists in not punishing any kind of opinion as long as it doesn't, doesn't issue in some kind of criminal action. And uh, toleration of opinion is the first form of toleration that arises. Well, can you uh, give some illustrations of periods in history which have been tolerant? Yes, and it really does begin with the end of the Thirty Years' War. Mm, it uh, didn't begin in England until a little later because we were in the middle of our civil war at that time. But it began very soon after that. And uh, uh, the first really tolerant state was Holland. Uh, all the leading intellects of the 17th century, at some period of their lives, had to take refuge in Holland. And uh, if there hadn't been Holland, they'd have been wiped out. Uh, the English were no better than other people at that time. There was uh, a parliamentary investigation which uh, decided that Hobbes was very, very wicked. And uh, it was decreed that no work by Hobbes was to be published in England. And it wasn't until a long, long time. Would you say that ancient Athens was a tolerant state? It was more or less tolerant. It was uh, more tolerant than modern states were until the 18th century. But it was not, of course, completely tolerant. Uh, everybody knows about Socrates being put to death and uh, apart from him there were uh, other people uh, Anaxagoras had to fly uh, Aristotle had to fly after the death of Alexander they were not wholly tolerant by any means but how does one to know when one's got to a tolerant period I mean, how does one recognize this oh, you recognize it by the, the liberal freedoms uh, free press, free thought, uh, free uh, propaganda, uh, freedom to read what you like, uh, freedom to uh, have whatever religion you like or lack of religion. 
But now, pretty well in the West, this exists today, and yet you were saying just now that we've never been in a period where there was more fanaticism. Well, I don't think it's true that it exists. Uh, I mean, uh, take, for instance, what they did in America, which was to go through all public libraries, and any book that gave any information about Russia was destroyed. And uh, you can't call that uh, exactly tolerant. If you're not enthusiastic, you don't get things done. But if you're over-enthusiastic, you run the danger of becoming fanatical. Well, now, how do you make certain that what you're doing is all right and that you haven't become uh, in a, a fanatical state? Certainty is not ascertainable. But uh, what you can do, I think, is this. You can make it a principle that you will only act upon what you think is probably true. If it would be utterly disastrous if you were mistaken, then it is better to withhold action. I should apply that, for instance, to burning people at the stake. I think uh, if uh, the received theology of the ages of persecution had been completely true, it would have been a good act to burn heretics at the stake. But if there's the slightest little chance that it's not true, then you're doing a bad thing. And so I think that's the sort of principle on which you've got to go. Would this apply to political parties and governments? Oh, certainly it would. I mean, everybody who belongs to a political party thinks the other party's in the wrong. But uh, he wouldn't say, therefore you have a right to go and assassinate them. You, uh, there are certain things you may do when you think a party's in the wrong, and certain things you may not well, what do you think of the limits of toleration? I mean, you can get into a situation where you have complete license and chaos. Well, the general principle there is that uh, people should be allowed to advocate any change in the law that they like. But in general, though I don't say this always by any means, in general, you should not permit the agitation for a definitely illegal action prior to a change in the law. You may advocate a change in the law, but you shouldn't advocate an act which is illegal while the law stands as it is. I don't say this as an absolute principle, but usually.